right, welcome back uh, to Bubonicon 2021, uh, virtual once again. Uh, today, we have a panel uh, named Space Engineers Talk About Space Movies. Uh, so really, I just wanted to make an opportunity for some of my space colleagues to rant about their angst about space movies. Uh, we are a science fiction convention, so it's nice to bring a little science reality uh, sometimes. So. Um, I am Mandy Self. Uh, I also happen to work for the Air Force Research Laboratories uh, in the Space Vehicles Directorate. Um, I think technically we're Space Force now. It's confusing. It's one lab, two services. Uh, I do have a Space Force email address. So, you know, that's cool, I guess. Um, and I am a uh, satellite engineer. So I do a lot of uh, operations and uh, basically design build and operate uh, spacecraft. So uh, let's go around and introduce ourselves. We'll go to Luke. All right. Hey, uh, my name is Luke Walker. Yes, Luke Skywalker. Yeah, heard it before. Um, appropriate for here today, I guess. Uh, I am a flight system systems engineer. So I do systems engineering on the uh, spacecraft. Um, I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, California. Uh, most recently, I've been on the Mars 2020 mission, like you can see in my background. And so I've uh, worked all the way through development and, and work on operations on it now. All right, Sherry. Hi, I'm Dr. Sherry Holder. I am a, an, an engineer in the Space and Mission Critical Systems Group, working primarily on space systems and human spaceflight, um, human factors uh, at Draper Labs. All right, and Tanya? I'm Tanya Tavener. I work for the Air Force and Space Force, because again, it is kind of confusing at AFRL. I'm an astronomer, so my background is not quite so much the satellites, but more looking up at the satellites, so. And I should also mention that anything we say in this talk is entirely our own opinions and has nothing to do with the Air Force or Space Force. Or JPL. Or drivers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, nobody has any formal angst about uh, Hollywood movies. Just the, we have personal angst. Uh, so to start us off, we are going to talk about some specific movies. But I did want to know, kind of, what is everyone's number one uh, space pet peeve when you're watching a movie that takes place in space? What is the one thing that every time Hollywood does, or something that just always throws you out of the movie? Uh, I will say for me, it's any movie that treats space like uh, you're like a fighter pilot and that mm. space works yep. exactly like yep. fighting a jet plane. <laughs> hit, the, hit the gas yeah. and go. Yeah. I think mine's related. It's yeah. traveling in a straight line when you're in orbit. Uh, it drives me nuts when, they, when you're around a planet in orbit and uh, you just completely throw physics out the window and just, oh, it's over there. I'm going straight to it. <laughs> in fairness... Space physics is so counterintuitive. Like, go slower to go faster? Uh, what? <laughs> My personal pet peeve is mostly, um, I should say mostly, very strongly, the entire concept of uh, pretend artificial, gra or sorry, pretend zero gravity, where they use the wires and it's very clear that they're going in a very straight line and then on some of them, they go in a very straight line and then change directions. And they have not touched anything. They have not thrown anything. <laughs> and they just throw Newton out the window and say, it doesn't matter. We're changing direction midstream in our so-called zero G. Hmm. So I have a pretty good ability to suspend reality and to just watch uh, movies very childlike. And so I don't, my, I don't notice a lot of things. But one thing I, when I watched some of the movies again this week, I found myself, so Apollo 13 was my example. The graphics really throw me off. Like I, when they, when they go out of this, um, out of the capsule and they show the rocket and stuff, it just takes me out of the movie immediately. Cause it's like, oh yeah, those were 90 CGI graphics, right? Um, so that, that one I found myself over and over in, in several of these movies being like, oh, like when they focus on the people and the, you know, inner insides, great graphics throws me off every time i i also think there's a lot when they try to um 
visualize space events that aren't visual. And we'll get to that when we talk about stowaway. Uh, oh, yeah. I have strong Or the black hole about. in uh, Interstellar that is clearly yes. outlined with light. Yes. <laughs> Um, so as you guys can tell, we watched some specific movies. Um, so we kind of had some back and forth emails where we were like, what are we going to talk about? And we threw some out because like Luke hates, uh, 2001 space odyssey. Uh, I personally hate Ad Astra. So we did not talk about either of those. Uh, but we did talk, uh, we are going to talk about gravity, interstellar, stowaway, the Martian, and then, uh, Apollo 13 and hidden figures as our more historical, covering things that actually happened, whereas the other ones did not actually happen. So um, I, I did have someone ask me one time if the Martian was real. Um, so uh, speaking of, let's, let's start with the Martian because Luke is already on Mars over there. Um, so uh, Luke, is that an accurate depiction of Mars as our Martian expert? Okay, so I love The Martian. Let me, let me start by saying I love The Martian. I think Andy Weir spent, he did an incredible amount of research and he got so many things right. The major thing that I don't like about it is the plot premise of the storm. And uh, so I watched it again this when week. When they're going to take off, to be specific. Yeah, beginning. yeah, yeah. So at the beginning, you know, they get the, all these huge uh, structures getting knocked down and they're knocking over these big, huge rockets. And I had this funny experience this week where I watched the movie and then went back to work. And in our um, chat service, where we po they post images and videos from Mars, from the rover, somebody posted a picture of a, a dirt devil from Mars. And one of the scientists responded and said, wow, that's the windiest I've ever seen Mars. And it was like the dinkiest little uh, storm that you've ever seen. It's just the dynamic pressure because of the low atmospheric density is just never going to be enough to do more than like rustle some feathers and so that's that's the one part that really gets me in the movie it's like just not the way it just blows through stuff never going to happen so that's my mini rant <laughs> yeah, I love and as one. per usual the book definitely did it better yeah <laughs> the book had better physics than the movie the movie specifically i think threw away some of the real physics just to make it more visually appealing it's specifically the truck that he drives around. Um, I'm guessing after rewatching the movie that they intended the entire vehicle to effectively be your chamber that they pull gases out of and put gases back into. They show no place to actually put any of that atmosphere. <laughs> so basically every time he gets out of the vehicle, he just loses all of his atmosphere and a big part of the entire focus of the movie and the book is the fact that he needs oxygen to breathe and yeah so that one really got me <laughs> yeah having read the book before the movie I was like okay this wasn't as, as it's like you always worry that they're gonna mm -hmm. do a ton of changes and I was like you know it was better I had a fairly low bar for like movie adaptations but they kept so much right that I was I was actually pretty happy with it uh, mostly because the only thing anybody mentioned in the theater is we're all sitting there we're watching this with a bunch of uh, fellow uh, space students, nerds at the time, professors. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was an astronaut in there and we're all like, we're all watching it. And somebody goes, the sky's the wrong, not quite the right color, but I guess they had to film it on Earth, of course. And it's like, I'm like... <laughs> So if that's this is what you're being picky about. That it's this picky. is a really funny thing that, that the scientists on Mars deal with is like, what is the right color? And so you'll see these pictures from Mars that, that we have color balanced in many different ways. And people will say that one looks wrong or that one looks right. But like what, it turns out that color perception is so um, unique to humans that you know, I don't know what a movie maker could do to get it right or wrong. It's, it's really tough. I guess going back for a moment to the truck airlock, the reason I was so upset with it isn't because they chose to do that. It was because NASA has a really awesome vehicle mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. designed for wandering around on Mars that has a built-in airlock in the backpack of the astronomer's spacesuit, or sorry, the astronaut's spacesuit. They literally just sit on the in the front of the vehicle in their spacesuits. And when they went to go into the back of the truck where there's actually a space for them to be, they 
lock their backpack into the truck and then climb out through this little box they have sitting on the back of their spacesuit. Mm. And they don't have to worry about dust going in and out because dust is a huge issue on Mars. And dust would just get, get into everything. And so the fact they had that and then chose to use these trucks that really were nothing like that, that's what bothered me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think they reused that truck in WandaVision too. I'd have to go <laughs> double check, but I think it's is the, it same, the same, truck. same truck. I think it is. So uh, on the side of things I loved about the Martian, one of the things I actually enjoy the most is, is the people. Um, so JPL is featured in the movie. Uh, as yeah, my question ago. is, is JPL the hipsters of NASA? That's, I wrote that question down for you. It is a bit actually. <laughs> so uh, our weird relationship as not a real NASA center, but as a federally funded research and development center provides kind of some countercultural and, and the founders of JPL are were kind of weird, which contributes to it. So yeah, I think there is a little bit of that. But yeah, there's some there. The, I can definitely in, in about five or six characters. I'm like, I know that person, right? The you know the uh, Rich Purnell, the uh, Donald Glover character, or the the old crusty dudes who uh, operated the uh, Pathfinder in the test bed. Like I'm like, I know that guy. I, I know that telecom guy. Um, which is it's just really fun to be like, ah, uh, yeah, I know those weirdos that do those kind of things that make you know make us good at what we do. I did have questions about Rich Cornell's office and whether he would have an office that large. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's probably in a tiny dark cube, right? In reality, <laughs> they make JPL look so much nicer than it is. I mean, JPL is a pretty nice campus and it's up in the mountains, but yeah, apparently in 30 years, JPL is just going to be like, or when, it, when is the date? I don't remember. It's in the 2030s, near, it's right? Near future. I okay, don't all right. Yeah. Well, whatever. JPL gets really, really nice then. <laughs> and everybody gets a big office. Yeah. I actually appreciate the year vagueness so you can be like less on the anachronism in the future. Yeah. <laughs> and it can always be near future, right? Until we're on Mars, it's always just the near future. Okay, yeah. so the let me say the other thing that kind of bothers me about the movie is the uh, really short uh, surface mission. And so I'll say that I'm not uh, a human Mars uh, exploration expert but the short mission is very confusing to me because of the, the timelines for, you know, we have these two year launch windows. And so I don't know how he worked out how it was supposed to work with that, the cycler going back and forth, but that one kind of bothered me that they were only supposed to be there for like 15 or 30 days. It's like, I, I don't know. I, I imagine when we go to planet, we're gonna plan for being there for a, yeah. something like a full transfer cycle. I remember that cost? being a huge discussion around the time it was written, though, was, you know, would, if we went to Mars, would it be for two, would it be for two weeks so that we can get home, home as quickly as possible and not leave them there? Or would it be for like right. a year or two? <laughs> so I, I Tanya, think a large. Oh, go ahead. I was about to say, I, I believe you have uh, some thoughts or feelings about the ending maneuver of the Martian. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes. So for that one, uh, but I, I do want to first mention, I, I think the reason they ha had such a short time period, that was just pure plot. If they made it two years, where's the food issue? Yeah. Right. So he'd eat forever. Um, but for the very ending of the movie, and yes, we are spoiling every single movie on this list. Uh, 100%. <laughs> yes. For the ending of the movie where Matt Damon's character is, basically being remote controlled off Mars. Somebody else is the pilot. He's just sitting in the capsule. Um, the problem with that when I first watched it was I was sitting there going, okay, if you're launching through an atmosphere, you're coming back down through an atmosphere, you've got a whole lot of heat, you've got a whole lot of stuff happening and radio communications and other forms of Plasma light blackout. transfer communication really don't work well. Yep. You, this is the reason for the Apollo 13, that blackout where they're going, did they live? Did they die? We don't know until they're actually on the ground. And so they say they're having this guy remote control him up. I was going, okay, how? But shortly after that, um, I don't remember how shortly, but it was relatively shortly after that movie came out. Uh, I remember hearing about the Russians successfully maintaining contact with a craft as it was going through the atmosphere. 
So that one was kind of cool, a retroactive, okay, yes, there might be a way to do it if you manage to hit just the right wavelength or whatever it was they did to successfully do that. Yeah, I mean, I know we have plasma blackout for, for our rovers on Mars. So yeah, there's a point in time where we don't hear anything for, I don't remember how long it is, but like a minute or so at the peak point. So yeah, maybe it's a frequency thing, not a telecom engineer, so I don't know that I could guess about it, but I didn't think yeah. about that. That's a good, good, good plot hole. I like it. Yeah. And then there's the Iron Man maneuver. Which, uh... <laughs> Iron Man maneuver. Purely in the movie, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, theoretically, yes. Having your oxygen come out would move you. Uh, I'm just not sure how well he could control that in any direction. Oh, why was he the fastest man in history? I never figured that out. Like, I think what... it's because of how fast the capsule was already moving, but I don't know why that would make him faster than the commander who was trying to catch him and match well, his speed. And I got to feel like somewhere in that transfer orbit, they would be going faster than, right? I don't know. I, I was confused on that. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Uh, so we love The Martian. Everyone loves The Martian. Let's move to a movie that uh, we have other feelings about, which is Gravity. Uh, so my problem with Gravity is that when it came out, everyone was like, this is the most realistic space movie ever. Uh, and then I watched it. So I'd like to throw it to Sherry, who I know has strong feelings yeah, about gravity. Uh, I have very strong opinions about gravity because, yeah, I, I saw it. Uh, I did not see it like opening weekend or anything. So we're hearing all these rave reviews about how amazing and stunning and it's such a great depiction of space and like the the problem of like of breakup and da da da. And I see this movie and I'm just. You you somehow have gone from a shuttle mission like like that low Earth shuttle mission to like all the way to uh, like three different like locations all the way to the the Chinese station like a drastically it, different altitude. It was yeah, Hubble. So their mission, <laughs> yeah, they start at Hubble. They go yeah. to the ISS and then they go to the Chinese space station. Okay, and, cool. And it's like, yeah, and I'm just like, okay, first off, Hubble's at a completely different uh, orbit. It's it's not even just at a different angle and inclination. It's way out there <laughs> compared to the rest of the objects of Leo. It's like here, here. And then they're at different inclination so if the if the earth is is in the middle and we're in different orbits they're they're not traveling in the same orbit they're they're and it takes a lot of energy much much more than as a friend put it a backpack the size of a chair to get from one to the other uh, and that that just took me straight out it bothered me so much and then there were a few other things that other other folks I, I was watching it with there's like we were we walked out we were tearing it apart talking about I was watching it we, we were all studying um, spacesuit design at the time so we're all going if you get out of a spacesuit you're not gonna be in shorts they just did that for movie so <laughs> like, yeah, like, they did that because Sandra Bullock has nice legs that's so the only reason they did that I, I haven't <laughs> seen I haven't seen gravity but my wife who you know works with ISS stuff uh she you works know, for SpaceX. Yeah, has a lot of feelings about the ISS, but the only thing she drastically hated about the movie was Sandra Bullock's bo booty shorts. She complained <laughs> about them for days. So, so yeah. I I really enjoyed the moment when it was like right after you know they got hit and George Clooney's like we have about ninety minutes till it comes back and she's like how do you know that and he's like well based on their speed and our altitude I'm like you know that because you're in Leo you idiot. Like you have about 90 minutes. Yeah, it's like, the speed oh, it's... has nothing to do with it. Like, I, I think the thing Hollywood doesn't appreciate, right? Is that altitude and speed are intrinsically locked, right? Like if you change your velocity, you are changing your orbit. And, and they just like, he would just be like, it's about 90 minutes because I know what altitude we're at, right? Like, and because it's Leo, you can always say it's about 90 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> that actually brings up one of my big issues with gravity. And it kind of goes back to what was mentioned earlier of them traveling in straight lines. Because not only did they effectively pretend everything was at the same altitude, not just Hubble GPS and space down. stations. 
but all of the satellites apparently were at this altitude. <laughs> GPS which would get oh, really right. crowded. <laughs> and it doesn't matter where they are even within mm-hmm. that altitude, what if they're if they're circle if like okay, yeah, theoretically you've got if let's say theoretically if everything was all at the same altitude, then I guess they could all cross the equator within that some point and get hit by something. But really? <laughs> Well, the other thing is, uh, in rewatching the movie, you catch things you didn't catch the yeah. first time. And this time, I really paid attention to the fact they said that this whole chain reaction of satellites hitting satellites hitting satellites actually started lower and was working its way up and knocking things up. They specifically said that. They said it was knocking things higher in altitude, which is why it was going to cross their orbit. I was like, okay, fine. You have things down here. Somehow they're adding way too much velocity, but okay, they're being knocked up, they're crossing your orbit. Now, why is it that the next time they're suddenly on your perfect orbit? If they're and coming from down here going up, they yeah. just keep going up. I mean, and, and they yes, hit gravity three doesn't times. Effect, but, and uh-huh. nothing's, losing velo- nothing, nothing's and, and that's just it. If you're losing velocity, you're, you're like, what? And, Again, the altitude. It just drives me nuts. I'm sorry. It, 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 it drives me insane. Because so I want to assure things. our viewers that all of our communication satellites and GPS satellites are not at the same altitude. Yeah. Uh, and that GPS is actually not in LEO. It's at like 20,000, something like that. Oh, um, yeah. So there is no... Way. even if the communication satellites she was using went down which i could believe you know maybe there's some like relays if we're going to be you know i think star starlink isn't going to be in leo yeah it, completely pretending that there's no such thing as ground stations yes that would yeah, not yeah. be hit by satellites you know and, and <laughs> pretending and pretending just even from the very beginning that you would have someone who was pulled up to do a mission with six months of training <laughs> Um, uh, no, <laughs> there was just so much she wasn't so. So, my, my biggest problem with gravity remove all of the junk science, just remove it is actually the horrible astronaut behavior on orbit. Uh, you have George Clooney zipping around, wasting his thrust as if being disconnected from a space shuttle is no big deal, right? You have this other guy who is tethered to the space shuttle. But he keeps like purposefully pushing himself off like wee yippee as if that tether couldn't just break on him at some point and then you have sandra bullock who clearly has no training like i'm sorry you guys our, our astronauts are better trained than us i watched yeah. another I, mean, man... oh, I watched a, another netflix one not not on our list but that was our biggest complaint from sarah and i was they were so dramatic and they were so bad at teamwork and i was like no like that's not how we make astronauts anymore. Like maybe a little bit of the jet jockeys back in the day, but now it's like, man, you really have to be a team player. Yeah, it's like they would be right there working close up with it. Nobody would be very far away from each other. No one would be very far away from the sh- from the shuttle or the satellite or whatever they're working yeah. on. Like everybody's going to be close in. Everybody's going to be communicating. Everyone's going to be calm in an emergency. <laughs> Another thing is that manned maneuvering unit that George Clooney's character was using. That is actually the name that was given to the first unit that was able to freely maneuver and not be connected to anything. So that part was true. The thing is, I believe it was only one mission that actually used the manned maneuvering unit as such. Because after that, they were like, you know, this really isn't safe. Let's make the safer version, which they actually called it the safer something or other. And all it was was the MMU with a tether attaching you to the vehicle. <laughs> yeah, it's actually so just that, called safer. Like that's yeah, the just, okay, it's just safer. safer. Yeah, it's and, and that way, if something goes catastrophically wrong, you pull yourself back in. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, oh, yeah. There was another scene I want to mention in Gravity, where actually George Clooney's death did not have to happen. Science wise, he never died. It's only plot wise that forced his death because it was this thing where Sandra Bullock is being held on by some cables wrapped around her leg and 
George Clooney is being pulled away and it's the pulling away that has to let go of her. They clearly showed both of them coming to a complete stop at one point. If you come to a complete stop, you stop. There's nothing acting on you. If you don't have anything acting on you, you don't go anywhere. And thus the entire concept of like holding, hanging off a building doesn't apply here. You don't have to drop the person so you survive. <laughs> All she had to do was just a little tiny tug and he would have come towards her. I mean, to be fair, I probably would have let George Clooney die too at this point in the movie because he was very annoying. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and plot wise, it was good, but in terms of science, he did not have to die. <laughs> so, yeah, one of the coolest things about being weightless and any, in whether it's simulated in a plane or, on, or actually on orbit is that you can push with like a toe or just barely a finger and you start moving and you go and you're not going to stop. <laughs> Until and that's a, yeah. <laughs> that's a constant crime in space movies is that they feel the need to continuously thrust. You know, the physics in the, uh, I don't know if we're going there to the stowaway with the center. I think we should go to the stowaway because that is another astronaut's lack of safety. So please keep going. Well, okay, so I spent the whole movie trying to figure out the physics on the centrifuge and, and that scene where they're they're going from one side to the other and then back and then she drops the tank and it very dramatically falls away. And I just, I don't know, maybe I, my uh, rotating in frame physics is just not good enough, but I could never figure out how how weird it was, but I was confused by that the whole time. So, so and that's, a, that's a common plot point when filmmakers don't want to do wire work is that they will just be like artificial gravity or, you know, maybe like centrifuge, you know, something that they're going to spin so that they can have some gravity. But it always is, it's that always one quite was confusing. confusing because the gravity changed halfway through, right? Like they're you going to the on midpoint this... and there's like no gravity or something. And, and then on the yeah, other yeah. side, they could just go down and then it was the same the other way. Um, well, they were trying and, to use the equivalence principle of just saying that acceleration equals gravity. And therefore, as long as you're accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared, your effect, that's effectively real artificial gravity. They just did it very badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the other thing with that, there's a couple of safety things in that movie. I'm not even a safety engineer. And this just annoyed me. One, they were never actually tethered during that point where they were climbing. Mm -hmm. She should never have dropped the oxygen tank because it should have been tied to her waist. Right. Like it should oh, they not actually have showed been it tied to her. Holding. What, they, what they, they showed that it was tied to her and then it wasn't tied to her and then it went away. I just, it, it, but even beginning with the premise. So the premise is you have yeah. this ground engineer who somehow got left on board and like bolted in. Bolted in. So presumably yeah. someone tried to murder him. I, I, I don't I don't know. Uh, but I so I did work at Kennedy Space Center for a little while when I was in um, school. I was a co-op and I went back and forth. And when you go out to the launch site as an engineer, you have to leave your badge at a specific place and take a different badge so they know everyone who's out there. So that if something goes wrong, they know who's gonna die. Like <laughs> if the if the site explodes, they have all your badges and they can be like, Mandy's parents, Mandy died, right? Like, I, so I cannot imagine unless he was murdered, like unless this was a planned murder, because if it's a murder, then yes, someone would have like fixed the badge situation so nobody notices, right? But he I actually thought that was going to, I thought that was going to be a plot point in the movie. I thought at some point they were going to be like, there's a guy on the ground who's trying to kill this guy because I was like, how did he get, how did he get bolted into this panel? Like, did he fall that far down that the other side was where he came from and they bolted up there? I, I don't know. I, that, I had trouble with that one. And, and just basic safety wise, like I, you know, my first ever job was actually at Space Mountain, which relates in that when you went out to the gravity area, when you were out on the track, you also did that badge exchange. So this is something that's done everywhere safety wise like i just can't believe it tanya what was your uh, my other thing with um stowaway is i actually watched that one right after rewatching the martian so the martian is this oh. entire movie about resources about food about water about uh, air to breathe all that good stuff and then stowaway all they care about is the oxygen 
Nothing else matters. They never once mention, do we have mm. enough food to survive? Do we have enough water? Can our recycling water system actually work with that many people? I, I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop and it never did. And I was like, okay, if, you, if you're carrying extra supplies for the colony on Mars, say that. Just say the words so that we can move on from the fact that you have this. <laughs> but then it was like, okay, so in order, I think they said the trip was 10 months, something like that. And in order to survive the 10 months, they need oxygen in a can about the size that scuba divers use. Scuba divers don't go under for 10 months. I, I wondered about the size of the canister too. I, I couldn't figure it out. I mean, and I think for everybody watching, this this pretty much illustrates why, yes, we absolutely love the Martian, even though we're having fun like picking out little bitty things. We all yeah, no, the Martian <laughs> really was one of the best in terms of actually getting it right. They, yeah. they didn't get everything right, but nobody gets everything right. So, yeah. And Stowaway also had at the end a uh, solar flare. Uh, oh, worst way to die ever. Okay. But also I, inaccurately depicted. Go ahead, Luke. <laughs> okay. Not a doctor, right? But radiation poisoning, radiation burns, radiation sickness. I'm pretty sure that sucks, right? Like, I think I, she would have been bleeding out of her pores at yeah. that point. Okay, so like, yeah, that really peaceful, I'm Anna Kendrick, I'm slowly, my face is slowly melting away while I watch the solar flare. No, like if, if I'm gonna have to be the sacrificial lamb, I'm like gassing myself with pure nitrogen or like maybe even just taking off my helmet. I don't know, man, but radiation, faster and better. radiation <laughs> burns and poisoning, not the way I'm going. Like, radiation poisoning typically if you get over the lethal threshold then okay you're just dead and if you're under the immediate lethal threshold uh, so there are a couple thresholds one is it kills you at some point and one is it kills you right now but if you're somewhere in between the it kills you at some point and it kills you right now you can be alive for months which and is why just she should have just taken her helmet you're, off <laughs> you're going to die yes because you're I, that's the true walking dead man scenario is somebody who's been hit with enough radiation to kill them, but not enough to kill them at this instant. And so it didn't seem to me, I, okay, it could have been like the biggest solar flare ever or coronal mass ejection ever, but it didn't seem like she was getting enough to have killed her that instant. So it well, it was apparently a... enough to create an aurora borealis in uh, <laughs> space. Out of that was cool, yeah. Space? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you can obviously ionize nothing and make yeah. it produce pretty lights. They made it look like almost like shooting stars, like she got hit by a shooting star. And I'm like, you cannot see ionized oxygen. I, I there's yeah, like, whatever the particles are. There's certainly are. an atmosphere bubble like, around her. <laughs> but, no, I finally figured out that they were sticking to objects. They were saying that it had to be around an object for the object to start glowing. And I was like, okay, so you're basically saying every object is getting ionized in the exact same way and producing the exact same light and no. <laughs> Still away. Yeah. yeah, not my favorite. I won't watch it again. Sherry, did you watch Still Away? I have not, but this sounds like something Don't. I need to <laughs> I, I, I feel like there are now some scenes I should fast forward to just to see. <laughs> I will say as a movie, that midsection is very tense and is what the movie is trying to be. Uh, but they should have been considering more resources. And uh, it, yeah, it's- I also just... don't think algae would have done it for them. I don't know enough about algae to be a botanist to guess that they're oxygen production, but I, I, I found that one. My other thing is the if algae the algae produce... was in like these con plastic containers, how was the oxygen getting out? <laughs> Not just that, algae actually does produce a lot of oxygen. It also produces a lot of highly toxic gases at the same time. Nice. And there are people who can be in the middle of a really big uh, cyanobacteria bloom in the ocean and actually faint from the excess gases of the algae. So uh, that also, yeah, and I'm guessing that all the tubes were to try to extract just the part they wanted. But the other part with the algae was algae grows, it multiplies. If you have X amount of algae at the beginning of your trip, you should have X plus something at the end of your trip, as long as it doesn't all die. They never once even contemplated the fact that no. you could increase your algae by growing it. Space botany. 
Mark Watney proved it's hard. Uh, so while we're speaking about uh, the visual ways Hollywood tries to produce space phenomena, uh, let's move to interstellar. Uh, so I will say, I'm gonna say some good things about interstellar. Uh, they, when they approach their spherical wormhole, uh, they do approach it circularly. You'll notice that they keep like circularly coming into it closer and closer, which after watching Gravity, I really appreciated. Um, so that was nice. Now I give it to the court. So one thing I do remember I also as a positive is that I think they collaborated a lot with some scientists on the visual model so much so that I remember that they wrote a, like a research journal article uh, about how it, some of those phenomenon would look based on on it. So at least they they tried, right? I don't. Yeah. Uh, so they, they did. Try. I, I was oh, actually. Yeah. Let's talk to the I was astronomer. actually teaching during the time period where this came out, and students would ask me about Interstellar and if they got it right. And I said, "Well, they got some stuff right, and they got a whole lot of other stuff really, really wrong." And then the students would tell me, "But, but, but they." talked to Kip Thorne about it and he said that this all was right and I was like no 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 they talked to Kip Thorne about very very specific sequences in the movie and he only gave them advice on these very specific sequences the rest of it is entirely based on uh, basically plot I, I can throw away the entire interstellar plot with one word spectra if you use spectra to look at the light coming from these planets through the wormhole, or even just stick a probe just on the other side of the wormhole to analyze the light coming from these planets' atmospheres, the spectral lines in that hmm. light tell you what elements are in the atmosphere. Right. Which tells you if there's any help whatsoever for life on that planet, which of course you would actually have to terraform if it doesn't already have life. And if it doesn't already have life, as far as we know it, you don't have oxygen in large quantities because oxygen in small quantities quickly gets pulled out by other molecules and you don't have enough for free O2. So basically, if you just looked at the spectral lines, you could throw away almost the entire plot of this movie, which is the reason why they didn't do it. <laughs> because if, if you actually found spectral lines of oxygen and water, then you go jackpot, that's the planet. And you forget about the rest of them. Except for one. that water planet. Well, no, if you just have water, that, that actually gives you different spectral lines. If you just have water and a whole bunch of nitrogen in your atmosphere, you're like, okay, this one we might be able to terraform. But if you actually have a large amount of O2, not only is it great for us to breathe, it means you already have life on the planet, at least as far as we know. I, okay, there might be something in the future that comes out and says, here's a chemical way to produce that much O2, but so far we don't have that. So, yeah. so Sherry, one thing that's always, oh, sorry, say, we haven't yeah. heard from Sherry. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So, yeah. Sherry, do you have thoughts? So, my, so my, big, my biggest question with that movie is plot is a plot point. And it has nothing to do with the, the sci fi, it has to do with decisions of characters and which planets were selected, which is if you're that close to a black hole, why, if you're so there. close, <laughs> why would you even look at it? I was you wouldn't to begin with. we yeah. actually already when we have we have all already we have thousands of planets that we're looking at in other solar systems so one of the things we consider is would the planet be tidally locked if you are close enough to a large mass and normally we're looking at stars because you know stars emit energy which we really like for life and black holes don't because they're black holes, so that would be another really bad reason to look at a black hole. Um, you'd end if you're that close that you have that much time dilation, you absolutely are tidally locked. You've got one side of the planet that always faces the black hole and one side that always faces away. And your waves then disappear as well because you've just got everything going out towards the black hole. Um, of course, at that point, the other thing they ignore is differential gravity, which is really important based on just people and getting that close to the black hole and the difference in gravity in your feet versus your head. Blood even, just kind of even stops without flowing. Even going there, I'm just like, okay, if this is so close that even after seeing it for like five minutes, you know that, 
oh, it's so close to a black hole, time dilation, the beacon wouldn't have reached. It's, it was just, it's because five minutes is 50 years kind of, a pro kind of a time dilation problem. You should know that already before you even approach that for, for if somebody got the beacon to the planet, of course, it's still going off from your perspective. Like you should, uh -huh. that should already be known. I should have already <laughs> thought about that. I, I have that yeah. question every time. Well, I just wonder about the gravity on that planet. I think Tanya already mentioned it. But I keep thinking like, man, if the time of light dilation is that bad, the gravity can't so be great for heavy. humans, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something's got to be w really off. So I, and I have one more comment really about Interstellar <laughs> uh, before we need to, to move on because we are uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, so there is one moment in Interstellar where he de-spins their larger object with uh, the smaller shuttle. Uh, so that, you know, that there's an explosion there. Uh, it's kind of like a space station thing. It's really spun up. They use this little shuttle. They connect to it. He matches the spin rate. So that's good. You have to do that, right? To connect to it. And then they de-spin it with his shuttle. And I'm just going to say that structural engineering still exists in space and that connection is so like they have these little clamps that clamp on there and the amount of force this little shuttle would have needed to exert to de-spin this thing that's huge massive and spinning so much faster i uh, would have sheared that connection there's no way there's no way it would have stayed connected that stuff still <laughs> exists in space so uh yes interstellar I actually think it's a really good movie. Just not, you know. It it's a good a movie to turn watch. off your brain. Yes. And don't eat I, corn after watching it. Uh, so, so and I, I did like the fact they included a Dust Bowl because another Dust Bowl is certainly a possibility. So. And I, I will include one point on the fun to watch aspect of Interstellar that it's definitely one of those movies, especially with the way they approach the like sci-fi near the end and the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, full disclosure, my husband writes fantasy, and there are points where you're trying to figure out how the plot makes sense, how the plot makes sense, well, how did this happen, and when you've got a magic system, he, well, sometimes it's just because it's part of the magic system, and you accept it, and you move on. Magic happens, literally, that's what happens, and for, so, when you're, Interstellar is one of those movies that just really appeals to that sci-fi level of magic, where it's like, oh, well, course it's fun and yeah you can turn off my brain and just enjoy what I'm watching uh and that's something that's not uh not a common thread in some of the movies we've been talking about <laughs> that is true the the black hole Effectively. stuff at the end doesn't make sense but it sure is fun and makes a good story effectively I treated the magic system of interstellar to be aliens but they were they, the aliens they are Spoiler. Sorry. Well, yes, but <laughs> they they kept in, invoking aliens throughout the movie, and I was like, okay, that that must be the magic of the system. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have about twelve minutes left. Uh, so let's talk about some movies that are not science fiction, but science history, uh, with Apollo thirteen and Hidden Figures, which both kind of cover the same time ish period, though Hidden Figures is obviously a little bit earlier. So I, uh, I did not rewatch Apollo 13. I actually hate that movie. I'm just going to throw that out there. So to the team. <laughs> so sad. I so I love Apollo 13. I'm unashamed in it. And there's a couple things that I think it holds up really well. I think anytime they're inside the capsule, it just, it, the characters are real, more real than probably any other movie. Uh, and I really enjoy that. I think the dialogue with, with NASA mission control is really good. Uh, Sarah and I were talking about this because she sits in on a lot of ISS mission control talk and it's, it's very realistic. Now, one thing I've, I, I wonder at this point is if it's actually self-perpetuating. We've all seen Apollo 13. We all know how controllers talk. Are we now talking like Apollo 13 controllers talked, right? Um, but, art you know, imitates life, life imitates art. Yeah, but the way they go through Capcom, the way that, that flight runs the room, but it's really Capcom and the astronauts and, and what they're saying and not saying, um, you know, that that strikes me as very authentic. And, and even the way each controller talks to flight, you know, uh, I think it holds up really well. So th those are some of like the things I like. And I'll say, uh, I'll say that's enough for now. Yeah. Yeah, I, my I favorite. Love it too. I do. Oh, yes. 
my favorite part of Apollo 13 is the fact that when they film in free fall, they actually filmed in free fall. So first of all, I do want to mention that zero G gets tossed out all the time. There is no zero gravity. You're simply in free fall. You're constantly falling. And when you talk to the astronauts, yes, it does have that feeling like when you're going over the edge of the roller coaster and your stomach is just going a different direction from the rest of you. That's the feeling the astronauts have the entire time they are going around the earth in free fall. So when they did the filming, they, of course, didn't go up into space. What they did instead was they used what's commonly called the Vomit Comet, also known as Zero G uh, Enterprises. And they basically take a plane and they run it way up into the atmosphere and then they have it drop down. So everything's dropping again, free fall, and then they bring it back up and go down. And so they can actually match either true free fall or the different gravities of different planets by changing the angle at which they're going down. And this does mean that it's a choppy uh, filming because you can only do this for about a minute at a time. And so they can only film and then grab everybody and prepare for when you suddenly get hit with lots of G's instead of practically none. Um, so the fact that they really did film it there, I think lended a lot of authenticity to the motions. And as you were saying, the, the dialogue was really real, but also their motions were real. You didn't have all the fake wire work that drives me crazy because yeah. when people are hanging on wires and they want to pretend they're not hanging on wires, they tend to do things like put their legs up in a certain way so that it looks like their legs can just float, but they're obviously holding their leg there. It's tense. And I, I know this is really nitpicking, but I, I just enjoyed so much with Apollo 13 that they really were floating. They really were in free fall. And the fact they went to that extent, the fact that they actually contacted people who had been there to try to find out what really happened in certain scenes, that's a level of detail that you don't get in these types of sci-fi movies where they're doing it someday in the future because they don't have access to real people in that case to talk to. See, that's the part of it that I absolutely love is that historical element where they actually, it's like, it's, okay, it's, re, it's recent enough that like they, they didn't just, it's not just that they were contacting people, it's that they stuck to what was actually said in the room. Like if, they'll, if you talk to some of the folks who were in mission control, who were there, like they're, they'll tell you parts of the story where you're just like, that's practically word for word from the movie. You know? It's like, that's, and it's a little different because it's their personal perspective. Mm -hmm. But it's like it, it. They really did talk, did actually consult with the folks who were there and in the. Although room. Tom Hanks did change the most famous line of the movie. Houston, you have a problem. Yep, it actually the real line was Houston. We had a problem. Had a problem. And Tom Hanks was like, "That isn't quite immediate enough. Let's make it half." <laughs> I I do remember seeing uh, Jim Lovell speak at Georgia Tech one time in undergrad. And somebody asked him how realistic Apollo 13 was. And he did say it was pretty realistic, except that in the movie, they add a lot of fake tension between the astronauts on mm -hmm. orbit that he said did not exist. They did not have time to have tension, right? Like they were just solving a problem. That, that scene was swaggered and, uh, oh my gosh, Fred Hayes. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the one that I'm always like, I don't, I, I don't buy it, but. See, the, the pieces that, that always struck me as like from that Jim Lovell lecture was when him, he was talking about being, having his, his little bit of like, it, he uses it as a joke, but that little bit of frustration at them, uh, at them arguing about shutter speed to take pictures while they were going around the moon <laughs> and they've got the cameras up the window and he's, yeah, and they're like, well, you've been here before. <laughs> And that's just that's just so much fun. Like that something like that actually happened. Or uh, there was a Charlie Duke lecture where he was like, and I got the darn measles. <laughs> you know, like, it's like those are those little moments that I'm just like, I'm so glad that they actually talked to people. <laughs> so my favorite scene from the movie, if you ask me, like, what's the one scene from Apollo 13 you uh, you remember? It's the uh, square filters round holes, and I think it's just like the engineer in me that loves that scene where they're like. Here you go, here's a table, here's everything you can make a filter out of, like here's a sock, you know. I, I don't know, I just love that scene. It makes me happy every time. 
the other funny thing about it is that one thing that uh, my wife says sometimes is that uh, NASA with astronauts is so strict about having procedures for everything that they'll write really dumb procedures like for Velcro, right? Like yes, they you know, will. pull Velcro apart. And uh, so the, the emphasis on procedures in Apollo 13 is also really good. They're like, where's my procedure? You know, and it's like, yeah, that's really what they would, they wouldn't have done anything without a procedure. So that's another like small bit of realism that I really appreciated. All right, so we have about five minutes left. So uh, it's the end. Any other thoughts, feelings? I don't know if anyone wanted to mention Hidden Figures. I absolutely loved it. Hidden Figures was awesome. I mean, for that one, it's farther back in time, especially compared to when they made it versus when it happened. So I'm sure it was harder to get real people talking about it or even remembering specifics about it. Um, but it did bring up one thing. I heard at least that Katherine Johnson was instrumental in the Apollo 13 situation, and yet the Apollo 13 movie did not include her at all as a character. So I, it, Apollo 13 did an awesome job. Did they get everything? No. Um, and they also had a few other things that were wrong, such as uh, just a, a lot of temporal details, because it's really hard to pretend you're in a different decade than you are. Um, and Hidden Figures had some temporal details as well. But in terms of the people, they did a really good job. So one thing, one thing that I was interested in, both in this movie and Apollo 13, is uh, composite characters. So Kevin Costner's character is not one actual dude, right? It's, it's right. a couple characters from Langley and otherwise. Similarly, Apollo 13, didn't know that until I watched this time, but the, the, his character name is like NASA Director. Uh, he's like the short guy, dark hair that sits next to Gene Krantz or next to um, the head of the astronaut corps a lot. So neither of those are si singular characters. He's kind of based off Chris Kraft, the old uh, uh, NASA guy. But that, that I always wondered that in movies is like you feel it's really historical and you want to know who this person is. And then you realize, well, that person was actually, you know, multiple people. That's, that, that's an interesting aspect of these movies. Yeah, where they have they they still have to do some like movie sh movies uh, shuffling to make sure that everything fits in the time frame and all that. Right. Like, oh, it's actually three people. <laughs> and they do that with people. They do that with plot, and they of course do that with science as well. Mm -hmm. But at least they tried on the science on those movies. Yeah, I mentioned that about one of the, the only thing in Hidden Figures that throws me off is the scene where she's like, there they have this. They need to create a, a plot point, and so they're struggling through the math, and then she's like. Euler's method, and it always bothers me. I don't know what her, the real, I mean, she's obviously a brilliant mathematician and, and figured out lots of things, but that particular solution has always bothered me. Is like, was that really that novel of a, a numerical technique for what she was doing at the time? Like it's, it's, it's something that we learn as a basic part. So that one always throws me out, but. Anytime I see math in a movie, I make the immediate assumption the math is wrong. <laughs> and that they are oversimplifying to the extent where I don't even attempt to sort through it and see if any of it makes sense. Because <laughs> why? I mean, if you actually bother on some of these science movies, even if they're historical science movies based on real people, all you can end up doing at the end of the day is shaking your head going, why? <laughs> so... See, I love to know what it actually, when finding out what it actually was. So that's part of the thing with me and a lot of these movies is wanting to be able to like, okay, okay, if this were a real problem, let's try and do the math and see how different it is. Like, I, I actually kind of like doing that. It's just for yeah. fun. Yeah, so uh, we only have a minute left. So I think we're done. So thank you guys uh, for joining us for uh, virtual Bubonicon 2021. Uh, obviously we love space and we love space movies. Uh, and, you know, if anyone from Hollywood is watching this, you have an array of uh, <laughs> engineers who would love to help you make your science better. So uh, feel free to give us a call. Um, so thank you, guys. Uh, and I will talk to you later. And for the viewers, uh, stick around. We have more after this. So thank you. <laughs>